So far I've picked up on one or two hints of the poem may be about itself, in the sense that it's a poetic creation on the theme of poetic creativity. But it's not until we get to this final section of the poem that this idea finds its full expression. The artfully alliterative damsel with a dulcimer is, in effect, Coleridge's muse, the source of his poetic inspiration. If he could just bring her song to life inside him, he would be able to build that dome in air. R. H. Fogel, in a paper published in 1951, puts forward the idea that Kublai Khan is essentially about the reconciliation of opposite or discordant qualities through the imagination. The damsel with the dulcimer, of course, is herself part of this balancing of opposite or discordant qualities, being, as Warren Stevenson expresses it, the redemptive counterpart to the woman wailing beneath a waning moon for her demon lover. At the broadest level, Kublai Khan can be seen as a poem about the opposition of heaven and hell, with Kublai Khan himself in the role of God the Creator, and the poet in turn seeking to take on that role and build that dome in air with its archetypal dichotomy of sunny dome and caves of ice. This idea that the poem is a symbolic representation of the act of artistic and divine creation involving the fusion of opposites makes a lot of sense to me. The only thing we might want to add here is that Coleridge expresses the failure to achieve any such reconciliation. Could I revive within me her symphony and song, he says, essentially making the point that he can't. Coleridge then ends by saying what would happen if he could. He would build the sunny dome and caves of ice with music loud and long, and all who heard should see them. But here again, just as the poem seems to resolve itself in a clear conclusion, the words slip through our fingers, as it were, leaving us with more questions than answers. Elizabeth Schneider, writing in 1945, noted the parallels with the description of poetic inspiration in Plato's Eon, but as James Bramwell pointed out a few years later, the positive elements are undercut by the fact that if he could build the dome and the caves in such a way that others could hear his music and see them, they would not rejoice, but cry beware. As Bramwell puts it, Coleridge is under an evil spell, a poet intoxicated rather than inspired, and a paradise so gained is only a fool's paradise. The jury is still out on this. Michael Rager, for example, in a paper published in uh, 2013, challenges conventional readings of Coleridge's Kublai Khan that interpret the poem as presenting an ideal model of poetic creativity. And the debate on this issue uh, underscores an even more fundamental question. Has Coleridge delivered the goods here? Can we say, as Anita O'Donnell does, that in a poem concerned with the loss of creative inspiration, the paradox is that through that loss, Coleridge has created for Kublai Khan has been written. Or should we conclude, as Molly Lefebvre does, that this final section of the poem is a total non sequitur, a small masterpiece of confidence trickery? That's something you'll have to work out for yourself. I hope this video has given you some basic insights into what is or may be going on here. The rest is up to you. Mm -hmm.